Things seem to be running smooth on my end. All right, I'm even gonna try one more thing and then I will actually get to playing some music. I'm just gonna get back where I should be on the quality front. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry once again for the five minute uh, technology problems at the beginning, but hopefully by next week I'll uh, have it all figured out. I actually won't be here next week, so hopefully by the next time I do one of these it'll be figured out. Okay, so, yes, first tune I played there. I'll play it again just in case it was buffering for people and now they uh, want to actually hear the tune. This is a tune called Mississippi Palisades. Uh, by Chirp Smith, who's a great uh, old-time fiddle player, and he very kindly let me record this on my solo mandolin uh, old-time album, which you can find over at mandolessons.com. So it's in the key of G. Sounds like this. that things are still choppy it looks okay on my end but if you're having if you're seeing all chop let me know and I will do my best to uh, fix it <laughs> cool Jay seems like it's working for James <laughs> Tango Tony says seems fine. All right, I'm gonna run with that it seems fine and is no longer skipping. Keep me updated if it does. Uh, and I will continue to poke buttons. But let's get right into it. Uh, I've got tons of people here. Uh, if you got questions, I'm always happy to answer them. I'm happy to do requests as long as they're in the public domain so I don't get in copyright trouble with YouTube. Um, but what have people been working on? What do you got questions about? Uh, throw them out there. I love seeing the, people have great questions every week and I love answering them. So don't be bashful. Throw them out there and I'll get to them. Can be mandolin related, music related, you name it. It's all fair game. We got more people coming in all the time. This is great. We got Idaho and Spain and... Oh, I got a request for Big Sciota. I can definitely play that tune. I'll play that and let a couple questions roll in. We got folks from Minnesota. Uh, all right, uh, Big Sciota, great tune, uh, old time tune that also gets played in bluegrass circles. Also in the key of G. It's on my website if you want to learn it. No, that's not it. Uh, that's a Quebec tune that. Uh, there it is. <laughs>
lit a big Scioto, or big Scioto, depending on uh, how people pronounce it. People tend to go a bunch of different ways with it. But uh, great tune, and a couple questions roll in, and that's great. And we got folks from Idaho and Iowa and Kansas and the Czech Republic. Very cool. Oregon. Uh, Lawrence says, tell us about the armrest. He's talking about this little contraption down here. It's just attached with like a little clamp. He says, does it hurt the uh, finish? So this is kind of just a comfort thing for me. I got in the habit when I had a mandolin that had really kind of sharp binding. And it was com more comfortable for me to put my arm on something. Also, just have gotten used to kind of where it puts my hand over the strings. Uh, they're not a necessity by any means, but uh, I like them. Just totally pre personal preference, though. Um, does it hurt the finish? Uh, I think somebody even said, uh, Picker's Quest said, depends on the finish. Yes. Uh, if if you have like a newer mandolin that is maybe a varnish finish that hasn't had time to fully cure, it can uh, ding up the finish a little bit and like mess with the finish a little. Also, what I've found over the years is I'm not one for like really keeping my instruments super pristine. I play them hard and I take good care of them, but uh, you know, they get scratched up and dinged up and stuff. And uh, often you will get some little scratches around here. It does have some cork on the top and bottom. So, so you're not like really digging into the finish. But sometimes when you're like tightening up these screws to really get the the, the armrest clamped down, you might scratch the instrument a little bit. But uh, no, nothing, nothing major really. Uh, Recovering Bassists has another great question. Um, I can't seem to clear the playing with a pick hurdle. Never have played with a pick before trying mandolin and dulcimer. I'm making progress, but can't get to where I'm not thinking about it. Uh, I think uh, the answer you might expect from me, and sort of is the answer, is just like, you know, keep keep up the good work. If you're, you know, if you're a bassist not playing with a pick for a long time, you know, anytime I try to play with a bow or try to play something with, fing with just my bare fingers, it feels very unnatural, and I'm always thinking about it. Um, and you're clearly in the same boat, just kind of in the opposite direction. Just you got to put in the time. You know, it's, it's like learn. It's like like if you're in the habit of wearing a hat or like a wristwatch uh, and you take it off, it's going to feel unnatural. Or if you don't wear a wristwatch and you, you put one on, it's going to feel unnatural. But eventually you won't even notice that it's there or not there. Um, <laughs> And just keep keep at it. Um, the more time you can spend with a pick in your hands. Sometimes what I do, and this isn't about like getting comfortable with the pick, but I just find myself with picks in my pocket. Um, I just often like will have a pick in my hands, even if I don't have an instrument on me. And you know, you can just kind of like hold it and play around with it. Um, it gets, you get probably builds up a little bit of like finger dexterity to really get, you know, like so you're comfortable. I still drop picks all the time. I just dropped one, <laughs> but I got a bunch more sitting on my table here um you know maybe if, if if holding a pick is uncomfortable to you maybe just like keep a couple in your pocket and just play with them um it'll get you used to just like having that little piece of plastic in your hands could help i haven't really thought about that until just now but could be worth a shot lewis says working on the lilting banshee the timing worked better for me after going through the faster play along and adding the triplets yeah that can happen sometimes um So the Lilting Banshee is a jig that I just uh, put out on Mando Lessons. Um, and it's out there to watch and learn from. If you want to learn the tune, it's a very common Irish jig. And yeah, sometimes it, especially if you're used to hearing, well, I guess maybe even if you're used to or not used to hearing something, hearing something like up to speed and fast in sort of the normal way can sort of get the sound of the tune into your head and it's harder to learn at that speed, but you can you can sort of get the form under your into your head, the general shape of the melody, and then to get specific notes that are giving you trouble, you can go down to a slower speed. So Lewis is saying that the, he was having a hard time until he went to the fast play along version and tried that, um, and like heard all the triplets and stuff. That's very common, I think, and it's it's good. You know, it means your ear is really um, naturalizing to hearing tunes at at sort of what you would maybe normally hear them played at the speed you'd normally hear them played. So that's good. Keep up the good work. 
Uh, Steven says, I have trouble with picks. Never know what type is best. Soft, hard, large, small, things like that. Maybe what I can do here, I've got a thing full of various picks here, and I know what I like on this mandolin. I think it really depends on whatever... Whoop, dropping them all over the place. Uh, you know, whatever you like the sound and feel of best is probably the way to go. But uh, I've got five picks here in my hand, and I'll just take one out because it's kind of similar. Um, various thicknesses. Maybe I'll go from thinnest to heaviest and see if you can hear a sound difference. Might not come through, but it might. Um, so starting out, this is, I never use this pick on a mandolin. Some people do. Uh, it's just an orange uh, Dunlop 0.6 millimeter pick. Uh, I use this on tenor guitar because I do a lot of kind of full strumming and I never and I don't do a whole lot of single note picking. I guess I, I do a little bit, but it works better for me on tenor guitar. Um, but on, on a mandolin, it sounds like this. It's a little bright and harsh to me. I feel like I'm getting a lot of pick noise and a lot of treble. Um, moving on, same, same material of pick, but a little thicker. That one was a 0.6. This is a 0.88, so a little bit thicker. Same old guitar pick shape. Kind of matches my shirt today. Uh, this one sounds like this. That's a little more balanced to me, not quite as shrill. Um, I, I don't know if this is coming through, but I hope so. Um, it's a little muddy sounding, and I think that comes down to the, like, the pick material for this mandolin. Um, then, um, go to this one. This is what I do use. This is just a Fender Heavy, um guitar pick and that kind of has the balance that I I like it's it's you know it's not super thin so it's it's a little warmer sounding but it's also I think it's the pick is like a little more slippery and maybe a little harder or it's this one kind of the green one kind of has a matte finish this one's a little more like shiny and hard and slippery maybe um, and it just it, it makes it gives it a little bit of brightness while brightness while still being thick enough to uh, give me the sound I want. And if I go way thick, this is a millimeter and a half. This is a Dunlop Prime Tone, similar material to the Fender Heavy, slightly different. Um, and this one is I'll play with it and then talk about it. to the Fender Heavy, back to the green, and back to the orange. So I think I still, and it was interesting, I actually, so this, the really heavy pick is a little too thick for this mandolin, it kind of muddies up the sound a little too much, doesn't let through quite as much of the high notes that I like, but you know, you can get, the, you, can, you can get these four picks for you know, these these teardrop shapes are like a dollar a dozen. They're not quite, but they're like 40 cents a piece if you buy them in packs of six or something. Or just go to your local music store and they'll have Fender Heavies and Dunlop. And Tortex is the um, kind. And just get a, a bunch of different materials and thicknesses. You know, spend a couple bucks. See what you like the best. And it'll depend on the mandolin. It'll depend on the strings. It's interesting playing with this really thick pick. I recently changed the strings on this one to a different kind of string just to see if I like it. Um, and I actually like this pick and these strings pretty well. I think I still prefer the Fender Heavy, but maybe I'll mess around a little more and see if I can really find something I like. And I think that's a great way, you know, to not spend a whole lot of money and get a potentially a very different sound out of your instrument. You know, if I do the orange and the the thin orange and the really thick triangle brown, they're going to sound very different. And... So it's 
So it's kind of a long-winded little talk about picks there, but I hope you could hear some of those differences. You know, I, I think it really is a playing style and instrument and string choice and setup. All of that stuff kind of affects the sound and the playability and what pick is going to sound good on the instrument. So do yourself a favor, spend five bucks on a handful, on a dozen cheap picks. You don't need to get super expensive. Um, a lot of bluegrassers like um, thicker, big triangles, and that's what I use on my Ellis, which is maybe, yeah, it's right over there. Um, but on a lighter built instrument like this old Gibson, I like a thinner pick. Catch up with the chat here, because I've been yapping forever, and who knows what you all have been saying. TA says, I like the big stubby from Dunlop 1mm. Yep, we've got friends that use those. All right, Castle Shaw from Manchester, UK. Thanks for joining us. Tony from the UK says, should I cut off the Florida, which is often a little extension. This mandolin doesn't have one, but it's a little extension, often on F-styles, that kind of stick out and give you a couple more frets way up here. And he says, should I cut off the Florida as I keep hitting the fretboard? And you'll get this kind of pit click. that a lot of people don't like um it's up to you um what people often do is just like scoop it rather than cut it fully off some i think some people chop it straight off it'll definitely affect the look of the instrument but um if it's a sound if you're not worried about like affecting the resale value of the instrument and uh you really don't want that sound and it's really bugging you do what you gotta do um if you're comfortable with it do it yourself if you're not, maybe just bring it to a luthier and see if they can do it or make it look nicer. Or it's up, up to you, but it's certainly an option you can think about. Denise says, I bought an armrest, $35. Cost more than my mandolin. Yeah. Uh, it's funny how that happens sometimes. I've done similar things. Uh, that's a, probably a good deal on a mandolin, though. Under $35 mandolin. Pretty good. Alberto says, hello from Puerto Rico. Thank you for joining us. Talk about that oval hole. Yep, so this is an oval hole Gibson mandolin built in 1924. It, the, the model number is an, just an A. They made an A junior, which is like, it uh, didn't have, it was a little less fancy. It didn't have the binding and it didn't have the inlay here. Um, but then it went to A and then A1 was a little more fancy. A2 even more fancy up to A4, which was the most fancy oval hole. And then you get A5, which is an F hole and a more modern instrument. Um, but I love this mandolin. I've been having a lot of fun with it. I really like it for um, more kind of on the Irish end of tunes. Um, it's nice for old time too. It's just a very different sound from the F style. I broke a string playing raucous old time tunes on my on my A on my Ellis. Uh, so that's why I'm playing this one today. All right, let's see. Sheldon says he uses Tortex picks. Yep, I've seen those. I think I've used them in the past. Yeah, you know, try it. Go to a music store and try a bunch and leave with whatever you like the best of. Uh, Pelican 3 says, can you play the 1-4-5 chord in a G chord position? I don't entirely... Oh, G closed chord position. Yeah, so you're going to use... Um, like this G chop, I'll give you a couple options. You can do this G chop shape. And I have, if you want to learn these shapes, they're in the technique and fundamental section of my website. Um, probably left, I don't know what they could be under. I forget what heading they're under, but uh, it's the chop chord lesson. You get this G chop, move it over to C chop. Same, same shape in your left hand, just on the G, D, and A strings instead of all four. Just kind of, you go from a G to a C, you're going to go G chop, move over to C chop. And then you can move that C chop chord up to, to a D chop shape. So it looks like this. One, then four, and then five, and then one. And it's nice because my left hand can stay in that sort of shape. I'm not going G, uh, sorry, G, one. There's a lot of movement when I do that, but if it's this chop shape, once you get it, G, C, D, and G, 
all kind of the same shape in my left hand, which makes that a little easier. You could also do this shape, which is a bar chord shape, which you can find in the lesson um, Learn Every Major and Minor Chord. You'll learn this shape, and you have G, C, D, G, or 1, 4, 5, 1. And that's the same thing. Left hand staying in that nice kind of bar shape position makes things easy. Tango Tony says, I like those orange Tortex that you have there. 60 millimeter? Yep. Or it's point, point 0.6 millimeter, but I think that's probably what you meant. Yeah, I like these a lot. It's like, it's an interesting sound. A little bright and I could, I could maybe get into it if I spent some time with the pick. You know, it's, it's very bright and kind of jangly, but it's, it's a nice sound. It could maybe work nicely for some Irish tunes. I use these orange picks on tenor banjo as well. I use them on tenor guitar and tenor banjo. Maybe mandolin would be nice. It's it's definitely it might cut through a little better just because it's kind of more treble heavy. Matthew says getting my confidence up in bluegrass jams, but still stuff struggling with the lead in when it's my turn to lead a song. Any suggestions? What's the standard technique? There's a bunch of different things people do. Um, what you could try is um, you know just playing the you can think of like the last line of the song. So if you're doing um, nine pound hammer, the song goes nine pound hammer is a little too heavy for my side, for my side. Roll on, buddy, won't you roll so slow? How can I roll when the wheels won't go? So you could start your solo, or sorry, you were talking about lead in, lead into the song. You could start with that last little phrase. Ah, da da da. Yeah, ba -da -bum -bum. Take that into the melody. Uh, uh. How can I roll when the wheels go? And you take that to the melody, so you say, hey, let's all play nine pound hammer, key of G, and go one, two, three. Here we go. This nine pound hammer is a little too heavy. Um, you know, it could maybe. You could say like, hey, we're going to start with the last line of the song just to get people a sense of what the chords are going to do. Or you could just play through the melody. Here we go. This nine pound hammer. That might be a little easier for people to follow. Up to you. Depends if you're working in like a smaller band situation and you want to like really work on that intro. Uh, you can sort of make it a little more complicated. But if you're in like a uh, community, that kind of social jamming situation, trying to keep it simple. Just play a little bit of the melody and then start singing. And if you be, if you're confident and you know you like, play a little bit of that melody and then start singing loud. Even if people didn't quite catch what was going on, they'll hear you sing and like everybody will get on the same track and it'll work out. Um, but there's you know there's a bunch of different ways people do that. Um, so listen listen to your favorite album, see what they do, and see if you can recreate that. All right, Andrew says, happy 25th live stream. Cool. Not enough coverage to watch today, but I'll look forward to watching when I get home. Thanks for the super chat donation, Andrew. Appreciate it. And thanks for the anniversary uh, shout out. I didn't even thought about it. Quarter of a hundred live streams. Yeah, it's, or I guess this is the 25th hour of live streams. You can think about it that way. That starts to add up, I guess. Thank you so much for all your support, Andrew. You're you're a very consistent force, and I love I, I love seeing you here every week, and your donations are always greatly appreciated. All your support over the years has been great. Thank you. Uh, cool. Carl enjoyed the pick demo. Glad that came through a little bit. Cool. People are saying they can really hear the difference in the picks. Glad to hear it. Didn't know how that was going to come through the computer here uh key of e38 says you've mentioned how playing from chord shapes is often used in a bluegrass approach can you speak more as to how to become more proficient in playing licks out of chord shapes yeah i wonder if that's a better thing that i can really like think about and like put out a lesson on and i'm gonna be a little scattered talking about it but maybe i'll tr i'll talk about it a little bit here and then um also maybe try to put a lesson together because that'd be a great topic 
So if you have like these G, C, D chop shapes and you're doing nine pound hammer. It's kind of double, so I'm really kind of breaking it down, not into full chords, but into double stops. So one thing you can think about is with this G chop chord, you've really got, you know, you can think of it as this is a chord, but what you really have is, it's like six different chords. You have the full four string chop, you've got the high three strings, D, A, and E strings. You got the low three, G, D, and A. So you have all four, high three, low three, high two, middle two, low two. So I think that's six overall. Four, two sets of three, three sets of two. Yeah, six. <laughs> um, and you can start to use, so if we take the kind of the middle double stop out of that G chord shape, chord shape we have fifth on the D, D string and two on the A string. And you, you add a little, so you've kind of, you can still have that shape in your fingers a little bit. And you bring that over to the C chord, back to the G, D shape. So if you watch these two fingers, they're just staying with two frets in between them the whole time. And then you could end up high, you're back to that kind of top. Um, we could do the low strings. Uh, well, that's not the best example. But that's one example is, you know, think about some double stops, smaller chunks of chords, find your melody note in there and kind of weave a little double stop solo around and try to keep your hand in one shape, like in that sort of fundamental G chop shape. Take the middle two out. You don't worry too much about your pointer and, uh, or you can take, oh yeah, not, don't worry about your middle and pinky. You just have your ring and pointer. And you got your melody. There you have it. I hope that's helpful. And I'll, I'll think about doing a, like a lesson on that. That would be a good thing for me to do. Lewis says, I've been using Fender Mediums. Try the heavies for the sound. Yeah, give it a shot. You know, these things are so cheap that it's not worth not trying them, really. And most, most music stores will have them just sitting around by the dozen. Cool. My piano really needs to be tuned. Great screen name says, I think my grandmother played a mandolin like this one. My cousins have it. That's very cool. Um... Nice to have music in the family. Can I, uh, Recovering Bassist says, can I play a song in a minor key? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll catch up with the chat and think about it and get back to you. Michael says, last week you provided a site for learning the banjo. That's an awesome site. Yeah, that guy is great. Clawhammer.net. Josh Turknet. Already playing some roles. Great. Yeah, I really, he's doing some three finger stuff that I really want to get into, but my summer's so busy that I can't. I can't add, can't add learning a new thing into it. Uh, but this fall, I'm going to get some three-finger stuff down. Do you have a lesson on kickoffs? No, that's another... I'm going to start writing these down. Uh, excuse me while I tap on my computer and take some notes. Um, what would we have here? Uh... Solos out of chord shapes and kickoffs. Maybe I'll do like kickoff, yeah, kickoffs, maybe like ending licks or something like that. That'll, yeah, great, great ideas. Um, so all the, uh, let's see. Strummin210 says, what's the brand of the armrest? This is made by Doug Edwards. It's called a McClung. Uh, if you go to About on my website, there's a list um, of all my stuff. And you, you can see the spelling there, but it's Doug Edwards. It's Hill County String Works, I think. Um, but there's a, a bunch of people that make them. Um, yeah, I like this one, though. And I'm not sponsored by him or anything. 
but yeah all right oh the chest jumping all around on me Peggy from Canada thanks for joining us been using the 0.6 millimeter on banjo mandolin works well yeah I bet that would sound nice on a banjo mandolin Ah, the Pelican says, can you play nine pound hammer in the key of G and then A and then D? I can try. I'm probably not going to be able to sing them in all those keys. Where to go? Um, but I'll give it a shot. I can probably do G and A and then D might be a little low. Um, this nine pound hammer in the key of G. Put it for my side. Put it for my side. Now we're going to go to A. This nine pound hammer. It's a little too heavy for my side, for my side. Roll on, buddy, roll so slow. How can I roll when the wheels don't go? Uh, key of D, <laughs> let's see. This three d is definitely too high for me to sing or too low it's not in my range but it's good to play around with and see what works for your voice and what doesn't joe mack from dublin thanks for joining us francois from new jersey all right lots of people jumping in great to see everybody those of us with smallish hands always work on breaking up those big stretch chords yeah i i know what you mean um I've worked with a lot of, I don't personally have particularly small hands, but I've worked with a lot of people who have small hands. And, you know, if you really like, I, a lot, most people, regardless of the size of your hands, um, can get this shape down with practice. That said, if your hands, like, if it really just isn't going to work for your body type, um, just take off a string. You know, don't, like, maybe take your that G chop chord, and rather than doing that, play just four and five on the G and D strings. <laughs> This nine pound hammer, and then it's five and two, then it's two and four, then it's four and five. Sounds almost the same. I honestly, when I'm playing, even if I have my hand in this full shape, I rarely play the E string anyway. Um, so kind of bring it down to three strings or two strings for your chop chords is usually just going to like leave a little bit of space extra in a good way for whatever else is happening in the ensemble. All right, Axel from New Hampshire. Good to see you here. I uh, thought the blue chip was overhyped until I got it, and then I loved it. It's nice to see that shirt. Yeah, are you coming in August? I hope so. Um, yeah, blue chip. People love blue chips. This is very similar to a blue chip. Uh, this is the Dunlop Plime, <laughs> Plime, Prime Tone. Again, no sponsorships. I buy all this stuff. Um, I, I used blue chips for a long time. It was the big, I used the big triangle. Um, about one, it was the 55 ct 55 it's like the chris Thiele custom gauge it's about this it's about 1.5 millimeter big heavy triangle um i used those for many years they're like 35 bucks a piece but there wasn't anything else like them my friend and i were like oh the, like i've heard a lot of good things about those but we can't afford to get them so we each got each other one for christmas one year and then ended up really liking them um but then i tried these which started coming out a couple years ago um and I really can't tell much of a difference between this and the blue chip. Blue chips are great. Some people can tell the difference, and that's great. If, it's, if that is sort of like something you can tell, by all means, play what you like. But these are a couple bucks a piece, and I like them just as well. So I sold them my blue chips and bought these. But yeah, blue chips and sort of this size is my go-to on something like my Ellis. Golden Gate 1.5. Those are good. Those are a little, for my preference, they're a little too rounded. Um, I feel like I need more of a point on my picks to really feel comfortable but a lot of people love those golden gates uh somebody says will you describe the equipment you use to record your lessons uh yeah i can go through a quick thing but also if you go to the about page on my website um i i have it all listed there i use a panasonic panasonic uh like mirrorless dslr style camera it's the g85 with a lens, uh, it's a 12 to 35, 2.8 lens. And that's actually what I'm doing these live streams with too. I have a cable that goes into my computer so I can 
use my nice camera to do these live streams and make them try to sound and look as good as possible. Um, most of my lessons that I have on my website are recorded with a Zoom H1, which is just a little pocket recorder. That all goes into my computer. Um, I use Final Cut Pro or, uh, or iMovie on my Mac to put it all together, do a little bit of editing. Not much, though, really. Uh, I pretty much just hit record, do it, and send it up. Um, for the play-along tracks, I use... I've got these mics here. I've, I'm always messing around with stuff. These are Audio-Technica uh, 4041s. I'm sorry if I grabbed onto that mic and made anything sound too loud. Um, I've been using those for the play-along tracks in the last little bit of time. I'll probably use these. I've got one down here for these live streams and one up here so you can get my voice and my mandolin as close as possible. Um, I'll probably start using these mics when I make lessons as well. I think they sound a little bit better than that Zoom and a little more, uh, a little more versatile. Other than that, I have like a white sheet in the background. I've got these lights, uh, so everything is bright enough. Light is a huge part of things. Yeah, and it's you know it's not a super inexpensive. It's like I probably have, not including my computer, like a thousand dollars. $1,500 worth of like recording gear, which is kind of feels like a lot sometimes, but considering what it can do, it's like way more than I'll ever need. And it's, it's stuff that would have cost like 50 grand, like 10 years ago, um, for the same sort of quality. So I'm, I feel lucky to be in this, uh, this era where that kind of quality recording stuff is available to the average person. And I use it a lot, you know, I make tons of videos, so over over the over the years, fifteen hundred dollars. If you break it down into the day, it's cents every day, probably. Okay, I'm gonna keep up with the chat here. Turnarounds, yeah, I I I, I want to make a lesson on that. Oh yeah, the jam every week. Um, what did, if people can remind me? I probably. I can't remember, but I think last week I said, let's do something next week. Was it, I think I might have said Waterbound. Was it Waterbound? Probably somebody can remind me what I said last week that we were going to jam on. We're getting towards the end, so maybe we should do that. Um, I'll speed through the chat here, though, and uh, see if I can catch up. All right, Key of E38, thank you so much for the Super Chat donation. Really appreciate it. Helps. Oh, and Recovering Bassist also. Super Chat donations coming through left and right. Really appreciate it. Helps me keep putting out things like this and running the website and all that sort of stuff. So appreciate the support. Uh, Recovering Basis says, any tips on being tasty with fills while playing with others, especially if someone is singing? Yeah, a couple like kind of broad tips is try not to play over top of the vocals. Um, or if you do, have it be minimal enough that it doesn't... Your, uh, your vocals always need to be like number one. Like if you can't hear what the singer's singing... Like there's something wrong in the mix. So if you're, if you get too fancy with your fills over top of the singer, you're gonna kind of overpower them. So like learning the song itself, you know, know when those pauses in the vocals are gonna come. So you can really just add a little. Um, and I would say, you know, play along with a lot of recordings. That's really gonna give you. People have a really good sense automatically of like what they're going for and like what sounds right and what doesn't so play along with some recordings um when um you know it's just you great way to practice and just try to add fills every time you'll you, in like a real musical situation you don't want to be the one like filling every single hole with fills but as a practice you know just like put on a recording and just try fills and you know you know it's a great way to like actually do play over the person and see and notice like oh that doesn't work when i play that there you know play too much when you're practicing with recordings so that when it comes time to like do a performance or be it play with other real people you know the right amount of like fancy stuff to put in but not also step on whatever else anyone else might be doing hope that's helpful yeah sheldon says learn new songs that's a good one Covering basis says I like 1.4 and 1.5 millimeter picks. Yep, me too. Uh, the old maid with major and minor variations. I can't remember that tune off the top of my head. I might, I might follow it and 
in sessions, but I can't think of it right now. Uh, let's see. Is Old Kentucky Waltz copyrighted? Good question. I also don't know that one off the top of my head, so I can't do it anyway. Um, Recovering Basis says I kind of learned the Kentucky Waltz. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I know there's a bunch of, there's a lot of like, there's Tennessee Waltz, Kentucky Waltz. Maybe old Kentucky Waltz is different from Kentucky Waltz. I don't know. Uh, what's considered the best pickups for mandolin? That's a great question for the Mandolin Cafe. I don't know. I use a little clip-on microphone. The Audio-Technica Pro 70 is what I use. Not great if you're playing with like drums and horns because it's going to feed back easier. But for smaller ensembles, I love the sound of a microphone over a pickup. Cool. Coldplay says he's getting a KM650. That's a great uh, great instrument. You'll have fun with that one. Cool. You got to go pick it up at the FedEx location. That's always an exciting day. Can I play Black Mountain Rag? Another one not off the top of my head. All right. Bag of, oh, Bag of Spuds. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I thought that, I was like, wow, three people want to hear Bag of Spuds. Yeah. So we I said last week for everyone to work on Bag of Spuds. Gotta drink more coffee. This thing's getting cold. Um. Yeah, so let's play a little bit of Bag of Spuds. It's in the key of D. If you don't know it, no problem. Try to pick some of it up. Yeah, if you want to work on it after this live session's over, you can find it on my website. Great Irish reel. Single reel, I believe. Um, so if you got your mandolin out and all tuned up, um, we'll jump into it. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat here. I think I, I think I got it all. Cool. Yeah. So let's play a little bit of Bag of Spuds, Kia D, Irish tune. I'll start out slow and then we'll pick it up a little bit after a while. One, two, three, four. Thank you. 
cool. I, I kind of kept getting faster there. I hope it didn't blow anybody out of the water. But uh, if you want to do that again and it was a little too fast, you can always go get to that spot in the video, use the little um, gear down in the corner and put it on 75 or 50 percent speed. Oh, cool. Francois says uh, Red Wing reunion made major and minor variations. Uh, I don't know any minor vary. I could try to make it minor off the top of my head, but uh, that's a great tune. I'll play it. It's on my website if you want to learn it. Uh, this is the, let's see what time are we going to do here? This is the Union Made or Red Wing, however you want to call it, key of G. Probably will sound familiar. And uh, I'll do some major variation. I'll, I'll play it once through pretty straight. And then I'll mess with it a little bit. And then I'll try playing it in minor. That would be an interesting, that's sometimes a fun kind of, can be a little goofy sometimes, but goofy is just fine in music. Music's supposed to be meant, meant to be fun. Um, so I'll try to play it minor and see what happens. That can be a, a fun little uh, brain twist. So let's see. that that was a lot of fun if not a little rusty but yeah that's something you can always try you know take a major tune and make it minor take a minor tune and make it major uh, you might confuse people if you try to do that in like a social setting but it's a fun thing to do on your own anyway well great this has been a lot of fun uh do i know maiden's prayer i used to know that tune and i've totally lost it's one of the first tunes that i learned i found like random mandolin tablature for it somewhere well, however long it was now like 18 years ago and learned that one but i don't know it anymore i should get it back into my fingers cool uh well maybe i'll play one more tune and if any last minute questions come through i'll see if i can answer them but uh thank you all so much for joining for another uh office hours Sorry once again for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Try to get that sorted out for next time. Don't know exactly when the next one is. I'm out of town. I got to go to a wedding next week. And then the week after that is going to be... I'm teaching at a fiddle camp. Axel, if you're still here, I hope to see you there. Uh, and then after that, I don't know. It's, uh, August gets crazy. But uh, I'll let you know when the next one's going to happen. 
So stay tuned. Uh, subscribe if you're not already. And see you next time. I'll, I'll play. We've still got a couple minutes. I'll play another tune. Got into my outro sp spiel and forgot to play another tune. Oh, and I got to request a tune um, for everybody to work on for next week. Let's do Waterbound, since I thought that's what we were doing this week. Uh, let's do it next week. Um, great tune. It's an old-time tune in the key of A. I'll play it as my little outro so you can get a sense of what it sounds like. And, yeah, it's on my website if you need to learn it. Um, if you already know it, try to fancy it up or work on speed a little bit or double stops. If you don't know it, try getting the melody down. Just push yourself, whatever, whatever level you're at with this tune, um, just see if you can take it to another level before the next time we do this. And hope somebody remembers because it's going to be a couple weeks and I'm probably not going to remember what uh, next week's tune is going to be. Uh, okay, well, Waterbound, let's see, here it is.